The, the, uh, I, I, the, the day's been running on time, and we're going to try to do the same. My name is Paul Yock. Uh, I'd like to welcome you. Uh, and uh, th this is the, the, the last sprint in the afternoon. So uh, we've got a great panel uh, put together. We're going to focus on uh, med tech. And uh, as you can tell, we have some uh, innovators who are, uh, are of a vintage that they're out there uh, doing this uh, in the in the first years after launching from from uh, from Stanford, and what we want to hear is kind of their perspectives. Things are changing so radically, as as you all know, as we've been hearing about today, uh, and we're going to get uh, some in the trenches perspectives uh, about what's going on. The bios uh, of our panelists are in your uh, programs, but I want to just uh, briefly uh, introduce each of them. So uh, on the far left is Darren Hyde, who's a principal uh, with Aberdare. Uh, Darren has a uh, MBA from Stanford, his AB from Princeton, uh, 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 did uh, medical school training, worked for Medtronic uh, for a number of years. Uh, next to him is Mo uh, Kaushal, who's uh, recently taken a new job as Executive Vice President, uh, Chief Strategy Officer uh, for West Wireless Technologies. He'll tell us about that, but a new initiative down in San Diego focusing on uh, technology advance and cost savings through wireless uh, technologies. Next to him is Darren Buxbaum, who's CEO and founder of Hourglass Technologies, a company in the obesity uh, space. Uh, Darren's uh, an, an engineer economist from Duke, who also got his uh, MBA from Stanford. And to my immediate left is Uday Kumar. Uh, Uday uh, did his undergraduate and uh, his MD at Harvard. Uh, residency at Columbia, uh, cardiology fellowship at UCSF, was a biodesign fellow, and he founded iRhythm uh, Technologies, where he is still the chief medical officer. He's also active with the biodesign program as a global fellowship uh, director. So uh, we uh, would really love to have your questions and input. What I'd like to do to kind of prime the pump is to find out uh, from uh, each of these folks ki kind of the, the one uh, key thing, that, that the most important thing that they've experienced that they didn't anticipate uh, at all uh, coming out of their training program. Uh, this, uh, and, and they may need to tell us a little bit more about the context of their, of their uh, company to answer this, but uh, Uday, let me uh, start with you, and, and uh, we're gonna go rapid fire. So your responsibility is to set the pace of, of going quickly with this answer. Sure, thanks, Paul. Thanks for everyone to, uh, for staying through the afternoon to, uh, to hear us. So I think um, I'll just give a little brief background on the company so you know kind of the space. I'm a cardiologist, cardiac electrophysiologist by training so I deal with abnormal heart rhythms. As a, as a biodesign fellow, uh, we focus on the, unmet, the field of electrophysiology and arrhythmia care to try to understand what are unmet needs. Long story short, we realized that there was an unmet need in diagnosing people, not by specialists, but at the primary care emergency room level. You've heard a lot about that today. We couldn't have anticipated it, but we were thinking ACO models even before there was one. Um, but long and, store, long and short of it is that we developed, uh, or we started, uh, the idea of a simple, single-use, long-term, disposable uh, cardiac monitor that could be placed in those settings uh, so that with one test, the patient could get diagnosed. And one of our requirements was really driving the cost down, so it was really at the cost of a blood test. Uh, so I decided to take the company forward after I uh, finished the biodesign fellowship, really spent a lot of time learning about what it means to be able to articulate a value proposition and really understand why this need. I, I really wanted to have the idea killed uh, if I could because I was giving up practicing, being a practicing physician. So I really wanted to see that this was uh, going to go somewhere. And you'll see why, at the end of what I was going to say, why all these elements are important. Uh, right now, we're four years now, you know, fast forward, <laughs> we're 130 employees. Um, we have, we're selling our product widely across the U.S. Uh, we should hit our 10,000th device at the end of this month and hopefully do 20 or 30,000 this year. Um, you know, and we've, what we're really seeing is Todd and a lot other people that you've heard today have really seen what we're doing as a different type of model um, in terms of trying to focus on not just the unmet need, but unmet need in a business innovation, business model sense. We realize that specialists see oftentimes patients they don't need to see, um, and oftentimes getting to a specialist is a problem really focusing on getting devices down to primary care level 
but understanding how primary care and emergency rooms physicians practice uh, and the cost constraints in the healthcare system has been really, really an important element of our success in the sense that when we're down in the low $100 range for a device that records for a long period of time, um, that's easy for patients to use. We use cloud computing to do all our algorithm analysis, so we're really scalable. Um, and more importantly, from the government standpoint, we've done this all in the U.S., so we've created 130 U.S. jobs. When you put all that together, you can see that value and innovation don't necessarily go, are not antithetical to one another. They can, um, they can actually survive and coexist and represent solutions to good opportunities. So that's just a high-level background, and I left a lot of things out in the interest of time. But three things I think I've learned that are important for anybody thinking about starting a company. So one is know your limitations. Know what you're good at and what you're not good at. I'm a physician. I think I'm reasonably smart, but I don't know everything. Putting CEO after my name would make no sense to an investor. Understanding the unmet need, understanding clinical, understanding how to develop something from a research standpoint, clinical standpoint, yes. So when I started out, one of the first things I did was try to understand, this is what I can do, this is what I can't do, but can I attract people who could fill in those gaps? Second thing, understand the risk of your project. People always get, and a lot of the fellows have heard me say this, people always think that developing a prototype is the most important. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. In my case, I don't think anyone didn't think that we could develop the device. It was really, how do you change a paradigm of delivering healthcare in the US? <clears throat> That's business execution. Uh, so if you understand your limitations and you understand what the risk is, my risk was really how do you secure some IP and more important to protect what we're going to do, but also more importantly, how do I track someone with industry experience who can help fill in that void? So my first hire or the person who came on board when I started the company is the CEO who's still the CEO, who had mul multiple years of experience in cardiac rhythm monitoring at different companies so understood that landscape. And then three, understand macroeconomic trends. You've heard it around all day today about the issues of uh, business model innovation, that value is now going to become a requirement. It's not just a nice to have, you know, not just develop a cool technology and later on figure out how to pay for it. You actually have to think about how you're going to get paid for it from the beginning. So it's not just, you know, we didn't talk much about regulatory risk because in our case it wasn't as big a risk, but understanding these factors of where healthcare was going, obviously we couldn't have predicted that Obama was elected, we couldn't have predicted the Affordable Care Act, but there were trends already going in that direction. So having as a requirement lowering the cost of healthcare in fundamentally solving the need was really important. So if you take those things, understand the big picture so that your need really is going to be supportable by what investors are looking at, understand your risks so you know what things you can address and what you can't, and then understanding yourself to understand, can you meet those challenges? Because, and if they don't all align, doesn't mean it's not a good idea, doesn't mean it's not a good deed, it just may not be the right time for you to solve that problem. So those are the kinds of things I've learned so far. That's great, Rudy. And I'm going to ask you to keep track if you have a, a question for the specific speaker. We're, we're going to go through these kind of preliminary comments first uh, and, then, and then open it up. And uh, Darren, in, in some sense, uh, it must make you cringe to hear that regulatory is not a particular issue from Ude, but, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> tell us about it. We have about. other solutions for that. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, um, Hourglass Technologies, uh, we're developing a medical device uh, in the obesity space. Uh, currently, the only effective treatments for patients who are morbidly obese, over 100 pounds overweight, are invasive surgeries like gastric bypass and, ga and gastric banding surgeries. Um, those, they're very effective, but of course, they're invasive. Um, they take place in an expensive operating room, uh, and they uh, carry you know, multiple complications. So what we're doing at Hourglass Technologies is we're taking, we're making these procedures much less invasive. We've converted the, them to a fully transoral procedure, so there are absolutely no incisions. Uh, so it's an incision-free procedure uh, that will dramatically reduce the complication rates and uh, also make it a much more cost-effective uh, procedure, which, as we've heard uh, throughout the day, is very much on the minds of, uh, of every country uh, in the world, and, and it's coming to the coming to the U.S. as well. So, uh, just a little bit about the company itself. Um, we're a 15-person company, uh, as as Paul was alluding to. This is a class three <coughs> PMA, you know, change the world kind of device, and uh, that brings up a lot of you know regulatory um, a lot of regulatory hurdles along the way. Um, we've raised uh, $11 million to date, and uh, we've been able to partner with great partners, uh, including Johnson & Johnson, uh, Maverick Capital, and, uh, and XE Capital. And, 
and that'll kind of tie into kind of my learnings uh, along the way. So a uh, big learning for, for me early on was I had no idea how difficult it was, uh, it was going to be to raise funding. Uh, you know, I thought, here you are, you know, obesity, you, you know, you can look at the cover of Time Magazine, you can look anywhere, it's a really big issue um, in, in healthcare. Uh, now, it's an extremely crowded space uh, before I walked into it. Uh, there are lots of great entrepreneurs and great companies working there. And uh, what and Uday alluded to it, you know, you have to understand the risk that you're, you're getting into. And for us, um, what we realized is we need to really separate the risks out. And it wasn't about, okay, just getting a device uh, that would work in patients. Uh, it was going much more fundamental and saying, well, what are the issues that people are having? And uh, it was the biology. Uh, it was the fact that the stomach is an incredible organ, but it's very difficult uh, to actually uh, control the stomach. And so we were able to say, split our entire system into parts, and instead of coming up with a full-fledged prototype, we were able to literally uh, build a small device for $10 on, on my kitchen table and uh, implant that in some preclinical models and, and show that, look, this, is, this has a lot of promise and use that as a leverage point uh, to raise the capital to move the company forward. Um, but it really took you know, division of risk um, to be able to move the needle with investors. Uh, another, another area that I never anticipated uh, was the type of funding sources. Uh, this is a, a obesity, and because it's a class three PMA device, it's gonna take a lot of capital to get this project. Um, to market. Um, some of our competitors have spent uh, almost $90 million and, and still never quite made it to market. And so it's forced us to look at alternative funding sources. So um, rather than going a very traditional uh, VC route, you know, we've partnered with strategics, uh, with hedge funds, and you know, really had to look at this in a very different way, um, much because uh, traditional venture has been shying, around, uh, shying away from really early stage, you know, preclinical class, uh, class three, you know, high regulatory risk devices. Uh, so, you know, just keeping the company alive to make sure that we can help treat our first patients is, has certainly been, uh, been an eye-opening experience, uh, but it's been a very rewarding experience and we can't wait to treat our first patient very soon. So interesting juxtaposition here of two different models, some, something where you wound up Ode, in, in really a, a cost-saving, you know, a, a little bit of a new space mm -hmm. uh, and, and aligned with what we're hearing about today. Darren, in some sense, uh, you're a classic strategy of taking an invasive procedure, making it less invasive, in your case, considerably less invasive, mm -hmm. but uh, different funding strategies. You had to invent your funding strategies, and I, I suspect we'll want to circle back on that in, in a minute. But Mo, uh, you're, you're coming at this from from a, a really different uh, perspective, and, and Mo, I, I didn't mention, you'll see in the bio, uh, spent time at the FCC looking at kind of uh, macro issues of, of uh, cost and connectedness and value. So uh, t tell us uh, where you're at and how you got to yeah, West. So um, after school, sorry, MD by background, ER guy then, ended up in venture capital, dabbled a bit in devices, IT services, as well as biotech, and then um, policy background way back in the day, and, and they decided to jump on the whole health reform wagon, and then built the first healthcare team at the FCC. And I think Tom, um, Tom Park actually summed it up very well this morning that health reform is a lot more than just adding 30 million more people into the system. It's actually how do we change the delivery mechanism, the incentive mechanism, and then how does technology empower this? Um, and then I ended up at the West Wireless Health Institute. We are essentially a startup, an 18-month-old institute based in La Jolla. Um, we have a couple of different functions. We have an investment fund. We have, have now around 25 engineers. We incubate technologies. We spin them out. And we do a, a range of policy issues as well. Um, and everything's around the cost reduction thesis, so not too dissimilar to some of the things that Uday was saying. Um, and, and I was asked to talk about some of my shared experiences or learnings. And I think the main thing I've learned, um, I've had most success in my career when I focused on, and I've been lucky in some respects, focusing on high growth areas and being an early person within that space. And I'll give you some stories around that. Um, at one point, I was looking at opportunities in medical device startups. And 
Um, although I haven't practiced in a long time clinically and I, I've done business school, I had business experience, I was told I was still a clinical person and had to focus on junior clinical roles. Um, my friend in the, front, in the front row is laughing at me. Um, and then the, the week after I was interviewing at an executive position within an online healthcare delivery platform. So I think the law of supply and, de um, and demand really also apply to how you think about your career. Um, the first guys who worked for Google, there was no internet company for you to get experience in. Medical devices, biopharma to an extent, is a 20-year-old industry. So the skill sets and the experiences always increase as time goes on. The first MDs working at Genentech had just an MD. Now it's P MD, PhD, residency. So I think that's the thing I've learned the most. By, by trying to pick high growth areas and being an early person to help shape it has helped me in better stead. Darren, so, so uh, you're responsible for funding all of these people out here. Uh, so uh, your perspectives. Yeah, so um, I work at Aberdeer Ventures, fresh out of Dr. Yock's fabulous biodesign class and the, and the GSB here. Um, we do early stage device investing, biotech investing, wireless health investing, hopefully here in the, new future, in the near future. Um, and I would just say that in my five years already, I feel like I've seen a lot because <laughs> things were working great when I came in 2006. Everything's sort of on uh, the path. That, you know, your, your product's working, you're um, uh, you know, hiring good people, things are looking great, and then all of a sudden things that are completely out of your control when you make the investment might have a really big impact on how things go. So the thing I learned the most is, is that you can do all the upfront work and figure out where the risks are going to be and, and vet everything you can, and that might not really have that much of an impact on what uh, happens down the line. So um, what we've tried to do is stay out in front, like, like Mo said, and I think the area he's landed in is really interesting, and then find great people like uh, Darren and Uday down here who are able to be nimble in difficult times and be resourceful, like Darren has been. Uh, in difficult times that find their way to success even when things are harder than they might have seemed at the beginning. So, so let's do start uh, getting uh, uh, questions and, and, and let me focus you too. Uh, I see a fair number of, of uh, young people, if I may say so, in the audience. Uh, and if you, if you have uh, career-oriented questions, the other things we're going to go on and talk about, I'm really curious to hear what, what each of these folks is doing with, with a global uh, strategy. I, I, I want to get to that. Uh, and, and then in the spirit of the day, uh, from each of their perspectives, kind of where things are going, where, where, how, they, how they're seeing around the corners. But, but um, any, anything uh, career-wise, um, Lynn, should we use the mics or can we, can we holler out? Are you okay with that? Use the mics. <laughs> I thought that might be the answer. All right. Um, so, uh, uh, question. I'm, I'm going to pick on Moshe. I'm going to pick on you. Okay. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to ask if, if, you, if you wouldn't mind uh, going to the mic. So, so uh, Moshe, as many of you know, also is you know could well be up here as as a uh, as uh, one of the the founder CEOs of a of a really uh, rocking uh, company. But if, if uh, we put you on the spot, what, what didn't you know about getting into the career uh, at, when you were here as an MBA? What, what, what kind of uh, piece of advice would you give? I guess the, the, the area with regards to which I was most naive is that I thought uh, that with respect to all the government interaction was being right and making sense would be uh, sufficient. So <laughs> our, our, our value proposition was quite similar to, to Uda's. We basically looked at something which was, which was one of the largest DME or, or medical equipment spend items for the agency and said we could eliminate uh, almost half of this cost uh, immediately and we thought that would uh, uh, suffice and, uh, and you know uh, three years later uh, it, it is not, it's clearly not, uh, not, not sufficient and, and that's an area where I feel, uh, you know, uh, especially someone early on needs to enhance its understanding on what it would really take to galvanize a government agency into an action, even if the action is beneficial to it, it often requires more than a good uh, reasoning or rationale. Yeah, Uday? Yeah, well, I was going to say, I think one of the things that Moshe hit on that uh, is an important thing to think about in terms of when you lay out your plan, <clears throat> is the cost it really takes to understand reimbursement. I think both he and I are on the same page in terms of 
Uh, one of the biggest problems with the, the healthcare system and innovation today is that re you can go through the entire FDA process and have a device that's deemed safe by the U.S. government. But payers, particularly CMS and then private payers, will wait for you to underwrite usage of a device clinically, show adoption, show trials, to then pay you. Even though at the end of the day, particularly, again, in my case, if you take into account the value that could benefit them, um, it's, not a, it's not a justifiable or rational marketplace at all, and there's no risk sharing. So I think one of the other things you asked, Paul, about a global sense um, from what we do on the Indian and Singapore side, it's clear that today, other countries can develop products just as good as the ones that have been developed here, but they've been doing so always with an eye towards lower cost. So at some point in the at some point, healthcare payers or healthcare entities, if I have a stent from India that's just as good and it's just as safe, and a stent from Boston Scientific or Medtronic here, and I have to make and one's half the price, but equally effective, it, I'm, I know which I'm going to pay because it's a rational decision. So if the U.S. government wants to really think about innovating jobs, they have to address questions that Moshe and I have, both pr provided them, is how do you risk share with us? I mean, if we meet milestones just like VCs want us to meet milestones for regulatory, why can't there be reimbursement milestones such that we prove to you in the next year and we'll cost share for this. If we hit it, you pay us some more. You hit it, we pay some more until some agreed upon. And if we don't, and we haven't proved that we're of equal or superior, not even equal, maybe superior outcome, Maybe we don't deserve to be in the marketplace. So that's, a, that's something that companies will have to look at. Do they really want to do that? And it goes back to kind of things that were said earlier, that if you really have a much better, or Dr. Manuel said yesterday, if you really have a much better technology, don't worry about, I mean, the payment will come if you really are going to deliver better outcomes. But I think this whole issue of innovative small companies raising tens and tens of millions of dollars after developing a working product that's regulated and cleared is somewhat crazy and is definitely an, uh, an issue with uh, the spurring innovation or you need to think about that because that's still going to be a reality for the next few years. So let's try to drill down on this a little bit. Uh, Todd Park uh, in one of the lunch uh, breakout sessions was saying, look, it's clear you have to go to the emerging accountable care organizations and sell your new technology to them, okay? Uh, you're, uh, so you're out there trying to do this. Is, is, is there any there to, to yeah. go to? Well, surprisingly, I mean, you know, surprisingly, even big payers today, the United and others are seeing that they need to embrace it. So while there are still some conservative private payers who don't recognize the value, a lot of other ones are actually taking a look and trying to look at data and trying to figure out how do we promote this to our beneficiaries. But again, we're at the the bleeding edge, we're at the front edge of this, so what really happens, and again, you saw Todd, I mean, he's as enthusiastic as you'll get, maybe, mm. except for Anish uh, Chopra, but those two guys are really trying to figure out ways of doing something, but again, they're working with the government, and one thing I like saying is the speed of a startup is not the speed of government. I mean, they'll never match each other, and the unfortunate thing for us is that that means burn. I mean, so, uh, so, so what does it look like, though? I'm trying to get a sense, yeah. uh, for, as much as you can tell us, for, sure. for you. Oh, sure. Are, are you getting penetration? Yes. So, so, for instance, you know, we're kind of in a hybrid mode because we can exist. We, one of my requirements, or our requirements, was we want to go out to the marketplace with an, at least accessible to some code. It's mm -hmm. much less than what we want, but something. Um, and we designed to that, so we're okay. Uh, and obviously, as we're proving value, we're, we have Palo Alto VA as our third biggest customer in the country, and they're paying, full, they're paying the price of the value of the test, because it's much less than what they were doing before, and they're seeing the value, because they're their own payer. So when we go to payers who are also integrated systems, payer and provider, they get it. You know, they get where we're coming at. They're not comparing it. We're dealing with the legacy fee-for-service system, and one of the unfortunate things, even though I'm a physician, is that every physician we talk to, just probably the same emotions case, this is a better technology. I see the value. I see your data. You have 10,000 patients. I get it. But I have this equipment. It's a worse test, but I'm going to pay for it because the more I do of them, I got to pay for my small business. That's the reality that yeah. everything's fight, that everybody agrees is broken. And, and you know, and I think one thing I'll other mention that you have to understand: a lot of practices are being bought by hospitals. That's because I think physicians as a whole are saying, you know, I went into medicine to see patients, not to run a business. And that's increasingly what running a business is as a, in a practicing physician. So they'd rather be salaried, focus on the patient, let someone else handle all the admin, get the you know, uh, economies of scale of a big organization. But that's an important thing to think about as you're thinking about your ideas, because even the type of coding, going from CPTs to APC codes to inpatient to DRG stays, depending on how practices merge or 
get acquired are also things you have to think about. So I think everyone approaches reimbursement. There's no way to know it until you really get into it and you realize what a morass it is. So, so hybrid model, uh, you, you know, running, trying, mm -hmm. to, trying to keep the electricity on yep. with, with current sales, but trying to penetrate these, these organizations Well, yeah, you target, target higher value customers. You yeah. see the value, use them okay. to bring the herd. Okay, good. I, Darren, I may, you're, yeah. I may put out a, a different type of hybrid model. <laughs> uh, so and obviously uh, obesity is, uh, is incredibly a very consumer-driven uh, space. Uh, I, was, I was very surprised to hear the statistic that prior to the recession, a third of patients who were getting uh, the lap band, like gastric banding for morbid obesity, were actually paying out of their own pocket. Uh, and so another model that may be a way of, you know, doing a hybrid approach and getting through the, you know, valley of reimbursement is, um, is turning to consumers and when, when the technology lends itself to that um, as, as one approach. And, and frankly, you know, we, we, the FDA is probably our bigger uh, hurdle even before we get to uh, reimbursement. And, you know, it, looking to Europe, looking to other geographies, uh, as a good launch launch point, I, I know most obesity companies that are starting to bring their products online are actually going to the United, the UK, and it's like whoa, like almost no medical devices typically start, you know, out going up against the uh, in, in the UK healthcare system where there is a lot of cost effectiveness measures, but there is a real private pay system uh, there, and there's a, a patient a consumer willingness to pay. So there may be a, you know, an option for technologies that, you know, even when they have large regulatory hurdles and, and there's reimbursement uh, afterwards, to you know, target consumers uh, as a way of uh, getting up the curve and, and getting through that, uh, that valley of reimbursement. So, so we'll go back to Europe and global in, in a little bit, but let me ask you specifically, is it part of your strategy? Are you in any way, practically speaking, looking at uh, existing ACOs uh, or, or uh, you know, how, how uh, fast is this going to happen and what piece of your strategy is that? So being a startup of our size, it's all about focus. <laughs> and, and right now, you know, that's, so, that's beyond the regulatory, that's beyond, yeah. you know, European. We're, and it's in a, such a state of flux at this point that by the time, you know, it'll be, you know, three, four years till we're there. We're, the only thing we're sure about is that the landscape's going to look completely different than it does now. So we're going to give that a little time to cook uh, and then, and then wait, wait to strategize once it's more solid. Okay. Well, that's clear. Uh, Mo, I'm going to skip you for a sec uh, and, and ask other Darren. Uh, so what, what are you seeing as successful uh, early stage models with, with these issues that we're, that we're talking about? And, and do you have anybody coming to you? I'm, I'm kind of fixated on this you know, transition to ACO uh, and, and whether you're seeing anything like that. I, I think nobody's really doing that right now, at least. And I wonder if you see anything. Yeah, we haven't. We haven't seen anything. Um, I have. He has. Yeah, I mean, that's, anything that's that I've I seen with Mo, an ACO so. <laughs> thing is actually from Mo, usually. Right. So he should probably answer that part. Uh, what we are seeing, though, is um, companies with commercialization plans elsewhere first, and we've seen more that aren't in Europe first. We've seen more that are in Asia first. Yeah. In fact, we just spent two or so weeks in China, and on the other Darren's consumer pay point, that's how they're paying for their health care, especially a lap band type uh, or obesity type procedure right now. And there are many, many millions of willing payers out there. So we're seeing stuff from that angle, not really okay. from the ACO angle. I'm, I'm going to hold you for one more minute, Mo, and ask, is there anybody in the audience uh, that, that's uh, with a startup or, or other entity where, where uh, you, you have a strategy, a proactive strategy of saying, look, uh, healthcare reform is coming. It's going to look like these ACOs, and, and we are actively planning for that, and th this is what we're doing. Any, anybody? Mo. <laughs> Take it away. <laughs> what, what, what do you want to hear? So, well, first of all, what is an ACO? I, I don't think I've heard a clear answer on that, but 
by definition, we have ACOs already integrated healthcare systems. It's just the thesis around why don't we provide quality outcomes? Let's link product solutions interventions to cost and quality outcomes versus the old aid adage of, of medical devices, which is let's drive volume, let's have high margin, let's ring up DC for a code, and once we're okay, let's just ring the system. Um, would I bet my 30-year career on that thesis? No way. Um, but the, the people I've seen more interested in the ACO model are unfortunately not from the medical device world, it's more from the healthcare IT and services world. Because mm -hmm. again, to enable many of these ACOs, it's really about data. Yeah. So um, how do we understand decompensation of disease before patients feel symptomatic? How do we, which the wireless health world is pushing forward, how do we better coordinate care? How do we give technology to care coordinators to improve those outcomes at a fraction of the cost? That's what we're seeing in the landscape. Well, what's uh, an example or two of that? So, again, I, again, talking to the entrepreneurs in, in, in the audience, I, I think it's going to be hard to bet everything on an ACO without knowing what an ACO is. So let's start earlier and go for some of the binary changes. So at the end of the year, 30-day readmission rules for CHF, pneumonia, and MI are going to change. If that patient comes back within a 30-day period, the hospital will not be paid again. In the classic fee-for-service system, they did. So it was actually good for that patient to keep on coming back. Again, it shows how asinine the reimbursement system is. The incentives are so misaligned. Um, so we've seen a lot of activity around that rule change. Um, and hospitals getting very interested in solutions that solve that particular problem. As time goes on, you have bundled payments for other conditions. The ACO, um, I, I can predict what I think could happen when, when it does kick off, but I, I believe the biggest change will be the distribution channel that these guys are going to have to go through. Again, the, the thesis of I'm going to sell to a physician and show him or her good data, and they're going to make a lot of money off that device, I think those days are also going to go. Um, salaried physicians are higher in number, as they said. The ACOs are going to be more centralized in purchasing, so essentially what Kaiser are doing already. So I think the biggest flux out of this will be the channel to sell stuff and the mechanism that one has to do that. Maybe I can yeah, talk go. about the ACO model and pick up on what you said yeah. about data. Uh, and use iRhythm as an example. So, you know, if any of you feel lightheaded or dizzy and you go to Stanford Emergency Room, they'll put on our patch. They'll put it on you if they can't figure out what's going on. You'll go home, and that's an emergency room physician taking care of a potential disease state, possibly due to an abnormal heart rhythm. You go home, go about your business, and maybe you have your whatever you had on day seven or ten or whatever. You, it gets recorded. You mail this back to us. We process the report. That report goes back to Stanford's cardiologists who are reading these reports on a day-to-day -day rotation. They'll look at it, they'll see that you had your symptom, they see that you had an abnormal heart rhythm, they'll call you and say, okay, now it's a different physician managing information that started with a different physician at the beginning. They'll look at that and say, okay, you need to come visit us. They'll come see you and say, this is treatable, come see an electrophysiologist like me and you'll get treated. Once you see me and you get treated, I might put another one of these on to see if what I did actually had the desired effect. That's an ACO with what we do in the sense that we're managing a disease state, enabling by a device that's really central, cent, centralized around information movement and management. I mean, I almost think of our company as really an IT company enabled by a med tech device. Every one of these things over 14 days collects a million heartbeats, and I know everything that happened to those million heartbeats. I know which physician prescribed it. I know what they find. So there's a lot of business intelligence, but again, I think it's the idea of leveraging information, which is really not expensive versus leveraging things and moving patients, which is expensive, is where things are going. So in a high level, that's kind of what I pitch, and they, everyone gets it because that's much more rational. Um, now we'll just see how it gets implemented. Yeah. Can I add one more to that? So yeah, I, I think please. it sums up really well. So the classic device experience I had was, here's a product and we will sell it. Um, that, that is changing, as they said. It's, it's more of a technology or a service with a device. It's, again, linked to specific outcomes that you're trying to achieve. Um, and, th and that's the big shift that I've seen. So, so Udi's uh, company is, is a good example of this. Can you, can you brainstorm, and Mo, you're, you're seeing these. Give us, I mean, uh, there, there's got to be a wider zone than, than just wireless, you know, yeah. parameters of, of, you know, heartbeat digestion, breathing, you know, so, yeah. so we can see those. But wh where else are we going? So the way that we're defining the universe, so devices are just a mechanism to capture data, but that, that by itself is nothing. Um, apart from if you can really capture novel data. So if you can pick up decompensation of CHF two years in advance, which no one can do, great. Um, but but in, in necessity, actually, most devices are more simple. Then that means you have to think about how is that data transmitted? So that's the wireless world. How is data stored? What are the analytics that you apply data to get information? That's the healthcare IT world. 
And then how do you present that information at the right time to the right person in the user interface? Um, and and that's, that's a convergence of three, four different industries, which, which no one's really figured out yet. Um, so there's some early players who are essentially making their competence around data. Um, I fundamentally believe there's a Google to be built within healthcare who can really um, understand this data coming from multi-source, um, whether it's genomics, devices, clinical data, and then really turn that into something meaningful. Um, and if you push me to where I think the biggest opportunity is post-healthcare reform, and I was talking to Darren about this, providers are now at risk. And I, I've heard off the grapevine some payers actually want to get out of the, the classic insurance business. They want to be reinsurers to the ACO model who will be at risk. And, and I think that's a really interesting concept. And you can see that all in the landscape. And my, my caveat is this is all timing. Um, how long will it take for this to settle down? And I think it's more years rather than, 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 than months. Which, which makes it very difficult as an entrepreneur in terms of your business model. What do you want to build your company for? But um, I'll go back to the basic fundamentals that the statistics around healthcare spend are, are terrible, as you know. 2065, we'll spend 100% of GDP on healthcare. That's not going to happen. Things will fail way before then. So if we really focus on product solutions that can help reduce the cost, which will get renumerated in the new business models emerging, I think that's a good bet to place. So, so um, I, I smell a contrarian situation here, which, which is, you know, every time I hear uh, value-based uh, innovation talked about, it has to do with the interface with information technology, and, and it, it's just the classic example. You're the classic sure. example. Uh, and, and then you see something like Ardian. Right, so, so Ardian is, uh, anybody familiar enough with Ardian to, to tell the, the story? Darren, too, do you know that one well enough or I, I won't pick on you? Okay, so, <laughs> so um, the, the basically uh, this is a, a uh, local company that just sold uh, very attractively to Medtronic that came up with a catheter-based solution for hypertension. Uh, and it was kind of based on some classic physiologic studies uh, that, that were done years ago uh, where surgeons would, would uh, actually cut the nerves that go to the kidney. Uh, kidney, as you know, is involved in regulating blood pressure, so uh, as, as a last-ditch procedure, if you, if you cut those nerves, uh, you could drop the blood pressure. Company, uh, the foundry, local incubator, picked up on that, developed a catheter-based strategy for uh, doing this, uh, and uh, the cost implications of that are absolutely phenomenal, right? So they have three-year good data on, on uh, reducing blood pressure, uh, and, and so uh, the contrarian play that I was talking about is that I, I uh, absolutely feel it in my water that there are great technologies, simple technologies that have not been invented that are cost saving and, and Darren, you may have one of those, right? Absolutely. Uh, so, um, But I think you could think about different ways. I mean, you know, we talked about it. I mean, one of the things I think at the government level is that, and it goes back to my comment about payers, we were, what I gave and what Dar and what uh, Mo and I were talking about maybe having to do with diagnostics, particularly information management. Yeah. So again, if you're thinking about an ACL model in terms of outcomes, I break things down to four big buckets. You know, you have an acute diagnostic that is changing, you can change like what I do, you know, changing when something is diagnosed. If it obviates multiple tests, multiple visits, repeat tests to get to the same outcome, that's cost saving. Oh. You can have um, acute therapies, so it's like an RDN. You have a one-time therapy, but to really value its outcome, you have to look across the disease state of the patient, which means not only treating them now, what did it prevent, but also treating them now, what did it increase in terms of their productivity, in terms of, you know, their ability to work, not be off time, et cetera. Then on the, you know, on chronic, you have like things, chronic therapeutics, taking a pill every day, getting dialysis three times a week. You have to look at what are the outcome effects on the disease state mm -hmm. to get to the outcome model. And then there's, you know, um, well, we talked about chronic therapy. Those are the kind of the, the buckets that you can think about, you know, acute, chronic, cro you know, sorry, acute point in time, chronic point in time. We're like putting in a defibrillator. One time shot, people say it's very expensive, but we know that we agree as a U.S., and Stephanus will tell us this, that we agree to $50,000 a year for dialysis to get quality of life years going forward. Defibrillators, 20 or 30,000, saves lives, but how is that measured? Yeah. On an annual budget cycle, it's not a worthwhile yeah. thing. But over the course of several years, it is. 
So, and I think guidelines support that. ACC doesn't recommend putting it in someone who mm -hmm. is happier to live. So I do think there are outcomes that are not information only that tie to outcomes-based ACOs. It's just that we have to define them better, particularly the technology. Yeah, good. We had a question in the front, and, and uh, I got blinded by the light. I'm sorry about that. That's okay. Uh, I'm Shubra. Uh, I'm a physician from India and a student at Stanford. Uh, so this is for the physicians out there. Um, how, just in terms of the opportunity cost, how valuable would you say has the advanced medical training beyond just the four years of med school been in the industry <laughs> in terms of giving you a well, leverage sorry. there? Yeah, I'll start. Some people thought it was useless. And then, um, <laughs> um, and then some, I think it really depends on fit. So if someone's looking for a clinical person, they'll find you. But I, the hardest transition I found initially was being a clinical person, then trying to enter into the business world. Um, again, because of uh, supply, demand, preconceptions. And, and that, again, that was in the classic med tech world. And then as soon as I just serendipitously stepped sort of sideways to an industry which was growing and evolving, didn't have a huge amount of supply of physicians, I, I got a lot more traction. I can say that, uh, I mean, I think for me, I took a year off after med school to see if I really liked device development. I realized that at the end of the day, going to med school, you, you learn something. Taking care of people and coding them at 5 in the morning and no one else is around in an 18-bed CCU, that's being a physician. So there are two different things. And I think if you really want to understand unmet medical needs in your field and you want to be focused more on the understanding the needs, figuring out how to solve those problems, it is helpful. The flip side of that is it's a long road. And, you know, and again, being able to practice and do all these things is a balancing act, but I think it really depends on, as Mo said, the right fit. I mean, if you're really going to transition more to the business side, maybe it's not as important. But if you really want to be more on the clinical insight and understanding from, a, and again, you know, what we talk a lot about is the design experience. I mean, we've tried to do a lot with the user experience for the patient, the physician, but I know that because I've been there. I'm not, I'm on the physician side, but it's really, really important to understand and empathize with those things because that's where you see some of those insights. Uh, and unless you've been there quite a few times, it's sometimes hard. So I don't think there's a right answer. I really think about are you going to go more business oriented or more perhaps stay a little bit more medically focused and keep doing the clinical invention side. I'll give that, I'll give that one a shot too because yeah. I was in medical school and left. <laughs> so. He's the smartest one of us all. <laughs> that's true. No, that's, that, that's He's a venture true. capitalist, by the way. So. <laughs> So, so another statistic. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So I think it, it just really comes down to if you like being in medical school, stay in medical school. I, I mean, honest to God. That, and if, if, if you're spending those, if the years that you're spending in medical school and you're probably paying a lot of money and you're working really, really hard and you're in the library by yourself with a book, you know, at 2 in the morning, if, if, that's, driving you, uh, if that's driving you and you want to take care of patients, stay in medical school. If you don't, um, if you don't, we should talk more afterwards, but if you, <laughs> if you don't, uh, do you need it? I don't think you need no, an MD. I don't think you need it. It helps. You get called a doctor. You get respect. You've earned the respect. You, you don't need it, though, but it depends on, you, you got to like what you're doing at that time. So from the perspective of you want to help the patients by inventing new devices, uh, would, would so targeted more towards probably Mo and uh, Dr. They, would you do it again? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think it's not, I, I think it's like, I would say less about inventing devices, but really understanding where the needs of healthcare are. I mean, unless you've, like I said, taken care of patients, understood all the craziness that happens when you're in a hospital or in a clinic or seeing patients come from far away with their loved ones or having to give someone bad news, that's where you see needs. You don't have to be a physician, but you can see needs from a physician perspective. You can still see needs in a very important way if you're not a physician, no question, from a business perspective, an engineering perspective. But again, in trying to understand what do you like doing, at the end of the day, I mean, you know, when you're in your late 20s, early 30s, you should have narrowed down somewhat to what fits with your personality and what you like doing. Uh, the world is not always, it's like the art of choosing that we heard of this morning. I mean, you have to make a choice. Thank you. So, so I heard a statistic uh, earlier this week that there are about 100 medical students uh, at Stanford and 27 have de want business degrees. So I, I think that may be a referendum on health care reform. I'm not, I'm not sure. But Darren, you're going to say something else? No, no, no. All right. Yeah, Good. I think, Maybe this, Darren. I think that this, I, the, the question of, like, what do we really want to do with our lives, you know, it, it's, uh, it's, it's one for all of us. 
And uh, you know, there's a lot of talk uh, amongst the, my colleagues here about, you know, why are you spending your life doing a class three PMA device, a, a product? I mean, this is something that doesn't fly around in the air. And you know, when it comes down to it, this is you know a medical need that uh, I thought was incredibly worthwhile. I, I had veterans in the industry that had you know worked at OBC startups telling me. Don't do it. They're like, you're gonna, you, you may waste five years, you may waste a decade of your life because that's, that was the feeling that they had, you know, working at, at their companies. And at the end of the day, you know, I, you look out there, you're like, there are 20 million Americans, not even looking at the rest of the world, just Americans, that are eligible for bariatric surgery for these weight loss procedures. And less than 2% of them actually get it. And you talk to the patients that are making these you know, gut-wrenching decisions about do they really want to go <coughs> under the knife, do they not, like what is it going to mean for their families, like this is, this is really an area uh, that needs to be changed and it's, worth, it's worthwhile. Thankfully I was able to convince some investors it was also worthwhile uh, and you know, I, you know, it's going to be in leading up to, you know, helping patients now. Can I just echo that? So if you don't feel that passion about what you're talking about in healthcare, I wouldn't do it. It's pretty timely now. Our friends from Facebook are all retiring um, and buying lofts in New York. And, um, and you, healthcare is so fragmented and regulated that you're not going to get those same type of opportunities compared to tech. You really have to be passionate about this space, which I think we all are. I think one of the things that I would ask Darren, I think none of us would disagree with, is that at the end of the day, if none of our companies succeed, I wouldn't have traded the experience for anything in terms of what I've learned. Um, and I think that's really important. You really have to go into it thinking about what am I going to learn from this experience and give you some, some reasonable time limits. I mean, don't say oh, I'm going to do this for 20 years and blah, blah. I mean, but really focus and say like if I can, when I started the company, I gave myself six to 12 months to get funded. If I couldn't get funded, maybe it wasn't the right time. But you really have to set limits. But if you do and you keep going and going and you're seeing progress, at the end of the day, that's invaluable. So, uh, you know, and, and, and from a company standpoint, experience means more than anything in terms of who we hire. Yes. Hi. Uh, my name's Edith. I'm a PhD student in engineering here, and I also have another career-related question. At Stanford, it's so entrepreneurial. It seems like there's this baseline assumption of, of course, everyone wants to start a company. Um, <laughs> we call it Googleitis. Yeah. yeah, exactly. But you know, starting a company versus maybe tackling some of those problems that you're passionate about as employee number ten or as part of a large organization, very different situations and a lot of trade-offs. And I was wondering if you could talk about the decision process to decide, you know, to do what I want to do, I have to start a company, and how you weighed some of those trade-offs for your personal situation. Somebody want to lead? I, yeah, I, I, so I started my career at Medtronic, uh, not a small company uh, by any stretch <laughs> of the imagination, uh, and I found it was it was a fantastic environment, and even. Even though I was in a, you know, a 30,000 person organization, I found myself gravitating towards you know, looking at challenging problems that I thought just need to be solved. So I ended up doing entrepreneurship uh, inside Medtronic, which was a wonderful place to start because here you have all this infrastructure, all this money, uh, and all these incredible people that can help you bring, uh, bring something to fruition. So it's, uh, so, but there's a, there's a pros and cons to that. You know, at the time I was, you know, 22 years old trying to work inside of a very large bureaucracy and getting buy-in, you know, from the president of the organization that, yeah, you should give me $6 million and 50 people to help, you know, bring this new product to market. Uh, and that process, uh, you know, <laughs> took, you know, six to nine months. It wasn't unlike actually fundraising. Uh, <laughs> a big chunk of change. Yeah. So, uh, now there's, there, on, and so that was, a, you know, brought the product to market. It was a great, uh, it, was, it was a fantastic opportunity. Um, but what I learned from that entrepreneurial experience is, well, there's a lot, you know, what would it be like to do the entrepreneurship experience? And, uh, you know, the value, I remember we spent a quarter million dollars on five lines of code because there were some programmers uh, in Latvia that were the only people that could do this in the world. And uh, then I look at what I did with the first quarter million dollars at Hourglass, and you know, it's, it's night and day. You know, we, we kind of started proving uh, in some preclinical models that, look, this could, this could be a brand new therapy for patients. Uh, so there is, uh, it's, 
the large companies definitely provide a great, great learning experience, but there's nothing quite like um, starting something from scratch and, and something that the world's never seen before. We, we shouldn't also underestimate uh, all of this. Is, there's a huge element of luck. It's, I mean, you know, you can, it's a lot of being in the right place at the right time. So I think it's more about creating the opportunities for you be, to be in the right place at the right time. It goes back to what I was saying earlier. Everyone can be an entrepreneur, but doesn't mean, and there's a lot of really good ideas, but there's not as many successful companies. And a lot of that has to do with things which are outside of your control. Um, so I think it's more about getting the right experience that makes you passionate about whatever you're doing. And hopefully that'll lead to providing the opportunities and experiences that will then afford a higher likelihood of getting that entrepreneurial experience if that's what you seek. So let's shift gears. Uh, did you have a comment? Yeah, I don't, just one quick thing on that is, I you're always better off when you surround yourself with good people, people who care about you, people who have done, whether you're starting your own company and they're advising you or whether you're in a big company and working for somebody, as long as they know you're there, care about you and want to help you, you're always going to be better off, I think. So, so I want to move to talking about global strategies. I'm going to ask you each to think about what you've done in your, in your, uh, with your own businesses. And I want to invite uh, people in the audience, too. We have some experienced folks, and Guido, you know, if, if, you, if you want to contribute <coughs> to the discussion, uh, please do. Uh, but let me start. Uh, Mo, I actually don't know what you would say about, about global strategy. So let's start with you. Uh, <laughs> so well, we, we actually have a product that we're about to spin up. I'll, I'll give you our thesis first. So um, I, you may have heard some of the other speakers this morning, but there are actually more mobile phones in the world um, than shoes, <laughs> and, and people have access to phones easier than clean water. Um, countries in Africa and India are building their healthcare systems from the grounds up without ever going to have the number of physicians that we have here, all these technologies. So it's an interesting place to see what's going on um, and, and something that we want to capitalize on. So I, I think the thesis of, of high volume, low margin devices and solutions versus what we see here in the US is, is a real opportunity. So we have a, a low cost maternal health solution that, that we're still um, prototyping and then at certain point that will be spun out is going live in Mexico first and then India and Brazil. And essentially it's not rocket science, it's very simple frugal innovation. The gold standard right now in a hospital is a cardiotocogram. Between five to $10,000, we have a couple of hundred dollars version which is Bluetooth enabled. The, um, you don't need a physician at the point of care. A nurse can carry that around. The data goes to a centralized place. And we're bundling that with blood, uh, blood glucose, um, blood pressure, and urine dipsticks. So again, not rocket science stuff, but will have a huge impact in maternal health and mortality, we hope. Darren Height, so companies coming to you, uh, what, what percentage have a Europe-only uh, strategy, and, and how are you assessing that? None have a Europe-only strategy. We did a thing recently where we looked at the companies where we've currently invested in, and every one of them on the device side was somewhere else in the world other than the United States, either selling or manufacturing or testing or, or every single one was somewhere. Um, I think that we've actually looked at some of the things that Mo was talking about. I don't know if we're good at knowing what's good there yet, but we're focusing there because of the constraints here um, that these guys know way better than I do. But um, yeah, I think, I think every uh, company sh should be thinking that way, um, but we're not seeing it in every company because sometimes we see a guy like Darren with a good idea and that's okay for the time being too. So, so you have companies coming to you with medical devices that, that are saying we're doing 510K or we're doing PMA in the US and d just kind of a standard. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. And if it's, and, and like you said earlier, there's still some really good things to be created in the good old fashioned medical device industry too. Are so. you funding them? Yeah, we actually, we actually <laughs> are. That was a deep good. voice question. Right there. This uh, is being are. recorded now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bring it on, yeah. So no, PMA are. devices go to Arbor Adventures and Darren. Will be to <laughs> um, Darren, so you, you're, you're both your strategy, if you can tell us, and, and your perspective. Yeah, so I look at this no different than I, I look at um, funding for the company, uh, because this is just kind of the next level of funding for the company. And you know, creativity is going to need to be involved uh, for devices that are class three PMA devices, because the FDA is not an easy place to get through nowadays. Uh, so I'm really focusing the company outside the United States and saying, you know, we need to be able to build a sustainable business uh, 
in Europe and in other geographies. And you know, we'll we'll wait to see what's going to be happening with the FDA. Uh, but I'm not going to bet the entire company on that. Uh, it's just too uncertain. So uh, we we like a lot of the opportunities outside, and so we're we're going to be gearing up for that kind of a structure. And and on a personal level, it, it kills me because I really you know there are a lot of patients I meet. Uh, I'm, I meet on planes. I you know I go out and actively interview, and this is a therapy that I'm really excited to uh, you know bring to patients here you know in our own country, and it's going to be a long time. So are you talking about Europe? Really, practically speaking, I mean that—that's where you'll get traction. Yeah, you, yeah. you know, Europe, Australia, uh, there, and these are just areas that, I, I'm, unfortunately, obesity is a global ep epidemic. Uh, you know, there, so we can go almost almost anywhere. But uh, there, like Darren's saying, there are some very interesting uh, countries like China and India where there's a consumer more of a consumer mm -hmm. pay bent, and that's a great uh, that's a great start. What are you Starting expecting to run into as a difficulty as you execute? What, 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 what's your white hot risk with that strategy? People, people. So it's just getting the right people aligned around the table that, and on one side, are not myopically focused um, on the U.S. Uh, and really look at at the other geographies not as O.U.S. but like as you know this is this can be the main entree. Uh, so th our biggest risk there is going to be really finding the right, uh, re recruiting the right people uh, to help us deliver on that strategy. But as far as are the patients there, is there, is there money there, that's, that's not the issue for us. Mm -hmm. to, to what extent are you influenced? So, so a common thing we hear is, gee, the big strategics, the big companies have all this offshore money that they don't want to repatriate. Uh, so great exit strategy to, to come up in Europe. And is that discussed around your boardroom? Uh, we're, not so, we're not too worried about repatriating money yet because we just want to make money. But I mean, let, let's, be, let's be real. Ardian was a stunning success, and we would love uh, to you know, follow that model of showing something that has tremendous clinical value in patients and then working with a large strategic uh, to help make that a standard of care. Uh, and that was kind of what I was learned at my time at Medtronic. You know, there weren't, there, there were a lot of other innovative things happening out, out else in, elsewhere in the medical world, but, you know, Medtronic was fantastic at distribution and truly making things a standard of care. And a big success for Hourglass is ensuring that our device gets to as many patients as possible. And so we'll go through whatever, whatever channels are necessary to achieve that. Ode, your strategy? Oh, yeah, ours is a little different uh, in a different way because we didn't have as much regulatory risk as a 510K. We were focused on the U.S. from the beginning. We talked a little bit about the reimbursement, which is a moderate risk. But I think the other thing we wanted to, to to think about is our device and our approach is very, very low cost, uh, and we want to keep driving that cost lower. So I think the biggest opportunities for us are in the BRIC country, in India, in China, eventually, eventually. But you know, I think we can drive the cost of this product and our service even lower with volume. So as we get volume in the U.S. that can help us drive manufacturing costs, COGS down, we can then go to Health Canada, we can go to NHS and say, as a system, we can provide this device far lower cost than anything you have right now because we've already, we will have been able to, you know, um, deliver the, the cost reductions because of the volume we're seeing in the U.S. The other thing is from a strategic standpoint, at the end of the day, I'm an electrophysiologist, so I want to treat people who have arrhythmias because we can treat them. Big companies like Medtronic, St. Jude, St. Jude's an investor in our company, you know, Boston Scientific, they make products, very expensive products, but very efficacious products for people who have certain arrhythmias. Emerging markets are big focus for them now. So at the end of the day, it's very difficult to penetrate India with a $10,000, $20,000 defibrillator and, un, and price it lower to get into the market or do what you have to. But to get a device that's fifty, hundred dollars or whatever it might be broadly to diagnose people who otherwise may you know, be left undiagnosed with vague symptoms, much easier value proposition to then convince some of them that, look, you have this big, huge pause where you don't have a heartbeat for six seconds. Maybe you do need a pacemaker. And with a device that they were able to buy and like, I'll do it, that's a selling point. So I think our strategy is more from a strategic uh, sales strategy 
in the use of the global markets. I definitely think there's a bigger market for our product elsewhere, but right now the U.S. will prove it out for us to go OUS. And again, one of the things personally important for me is we continue to export. I don't want to import. You know, well, MedTech what's, is a big what's, what's your protection in India and China? <laughs> so we have, uh, well, we haven't, you know, from our PCT applications when we started, you know, we've gone into Canada, EU, uh, Japan, but not much in China because they're really, it's, it's still a wild west. So I think we'll eventually get there, but we'll keep moving east, Europe, <laughs> and, and, until we get there. Hopefully we'll learn, hopefully some of the things we've seen on the Stanford India side, some of the more regula regulations and protections will be in place years from now. And at the end of the day, you know, finding more arrhythmias, if it floats everybody's boat in terms of devices, they have almost no penetration there. So mm. they're starting from scratch with a unpenetrated population of a billion plus. So I, I don't know if that's going to be too much of a yeah. worry. Moshe, you're our fifth man on the panel. I'm, I'm going to ask you about your global strategy too, if, if you would. But I also want to ask anybody else in the audience who is primarily focusing on a developing uh, nation strategy. Anybody with, can you, can you tell us about that quickly? Uh, there, there's a mic right next to you. That would be great. My name's uh, Peter Coelho. I'm a uh, rural family physician. I developed uh, a smart system for the neonatal space that actually, Mo, kind of mirrors your product where we're going for a uh, low cost. Um, the uh, barriers here in the U.S. were just formidable. Um, we were trying to push a device for risk reduction and lowering cost, and we just don't find that VCs were open to that yet. So um, India is, it seems to be a place with open arms. Um, and it's a, you know, a, a low cost, you know, a very different um, market strategy than the U.S. We, you know, our, uh, you know, cost point would be twenty thousand dollars here. We're going to be trying to bring it in to uh, developing countries for eight hundred, and using a three-tier market where you get it out to the poor for free, and uh, some of your uh, tertiary care hospitals you have a premium price. So multi-tiered uh, marketing strategy. And are you NGO funded? Uh, is it is it for profit? What's your model? What's my my um, you, the business model? Well, I'm still very. We're an early startup. We just uh -huh. uh, have our uh, working prototype, and uh, we'll be pitching for uh, different foundations here soon. Cool. Uh, towards July. Me. Uh, good luck. Bon voyage. O other people who've done <coughs> developing. Yeah, please. Hi. So I'm not with a small company. Verna Rodriguez with Boston Scientific. Hi, Paul. <laughs> Heard of that? <laughs> yes. Yeah. <Big> <laughs> So um, Boston Scientific is, um, has an emerging market initiative. So from a large company perspective, with all the changing healthcare um, and Boston Scientific historically being very myopically U.S. focused, um, I think is waking up and saying, oh, we need to sort of change what we want to do in the world um, in terms of selling products and not be so U.S. focused. So we're doing things like um, we already have some manufacturing in countries like Ireland and, and also Costa Rica, and we're expanding more in Costa Rica, but also we've started, we have a small group of folks in um, China that's a Boston Scientific-based company. And so we're looking not only to um, enter those markets um, by actually manufacturing in, in those countries um, to reduce cost, but also to be able to have a presence in those markets so that we can um, invent and innovate devices that are for those markets, not with the U.S. focus. So that's what Boston Scientific is doing. So that's why I'm here. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, stunning. I, I uh, heard John Capek's remarks this morning about the, the market shift that they're anticipating in, in five years' uh, time. Uh, just extraordinary. So, Moshi, tell us uh, about your strategy. So we mainly looked at the diversifying reimbursement risk. And before going global, one, one can think first uh, creatively about al alternative U.S. pairs. So one, one system which uh, we like is the, the VA medical system that, that dispenses about $70 billion of healthcare spend each year. It's a, a relatively more straightforward process to get on the federal uh, supply schedule, and that's a way uh, uh, to basically di diversify or mitigate a bit of the reimbursement uh, risk and something that we have implemented uh, quite, uh, quite effectively. 
uh, uh, beyond uh, the VA medical system with a, with a product like, like ours, one may start thinking creatively about FEMA and all of those disaster relief organizations. You know, they're stocking do, all Do you want to tell us about your product just quick? Because I'm yeah, not sure. So our, our product is basically a single-use uh, negative pressure wound therapy device for, for uh, treatment of chronic, uh, of chronic uh, wounds, and it can help treat uh, acute wounds as well once hemostasis has been, uh, has been achieved. Uh, negative pressure wound therapy, which is the application of controlled suction to wounds through an interface, a foam or a gauze interface, is the eighth largest DME category that on, on Medicare spend. In the U.S., the product sales are about $1.5 billion, uh, and uh, it's been the, cate the category has grown 600% over five years in terms of Medicare payment. And, and my frustration is even that we brought them a product that can just eliminate half of these costs just out of the, out of the box. Uh, 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 that wasn't, uh, uh, that wasn't uh, sufficient, but it's a therapy that basically has broad application to uh, a lot of soft tissue defects. And our experience in, uh, in the aftermath of the earthquake in Haiti, which we uh, 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 sent our, one of our co-founders, a clinician, uh, uh, with a lot of uh, products as a part of the uh, of, uh, uh, initiative of the University of Miami, we've seen that we were able to very effectively help uh, uh, folks in the aftermath of an earthquake, especially when there are uh, blockouts and no electricity and all the electrical uh, capital equipment type devices just weren't able to be uh, effective and they were treating uh, uh, folks at hospital tents. So that kind of brought us the idea, well, gee, we, could, we, we should be approaching a, a FEMA and approaching, a, and approaching a, a DOD more to understand what are their criteria so that they would stock such a product as part of a relief or, or disaster effort. That could be, you know, one stocking order could be our probably uh, revenue projections for, for next year. Another one is, of course, the VA medical system. In terms of OUS, we are implementing those very, very aggressively. So one of the uh, uh, methods we used to stay capital efficient uh, uh, in, in, the U, in, in, in our operations and be able to penetrate markets quickly is to really seek uh, uh, partners uh, that would help us penetrate, for example, the European market. Mm -hmm. and, and that also ties a bit to our, to our exit uh, strategy. It's kind of let's, let's dance before we, uh, before we uh, get, get married kind of, kind of thing. So there is some strategic rationale with the, with the choice of a distributor we go, we go with in the, in the EU, and beyond of that, we've, we've launched a, a, a regulatory process in, in Japan, we also through a, a partner that, that invested in us. But I think that a, all, all these OUS commercialization in, endeavors need to build on a, on, a, on a bedrock of FDA clearance. For example, in, the, in, in Europe, what's left after that is the ISO cert and a fairly straightforward process yeah. to get clearance. If you don't have FDA clearance in the U.S., it's a different story. Same holds for Japan, although the process and is more Your FDA incentive. pathway was? Our uh, FDA pathway was uh, uh, not a 510K. It was a de novo process, so it took uh, uh, about 18 months, something yeah. that I thought would take less than, uh, so, so than three months. So this may be an irritating question, but, but it, it seems to me you must be worried about uh, people uh, uh, re-engineering your device, uh, yeah. especially in Asia. Do, do you have a strategy about that? Yeah. So, well, yeah, we, our strategy, it may sound funny to you guys, is get, his part, get a partner whose dad is really senior in the, in the Communist Party. <laughs> and so nobody will, nobody will copy your, uh, your device later. So what we've, we're working on is really so, so we my, have a pro down here. my so GSB right network right to identify guys <laughs> who are well intertwined in the, in the political apparatus, and, and those are usually the joint ventures <laughs> and the collaborations that end up uh, with their IP rights uh, protected. So that's really our strategy. By, by the way, we have submitted national phase applications, uh -huh. both in China and, and Japan, but I'm just looking at the data, and uh, till, until early this year, there hasn't been a single uh, foreigner, uh, foreign company that has won a, a case, a case, a, a trial case in, in Japan, irrespective of the rights and the contracts that were signed. So we're doing that, but it's not something that I. But, but you haven't seen defense. devices emerging yet uh, that are competitive. We haven't devices. seen devices that are emerging yet that are there are competitive. We have seen 
interesting ideas coming from, from academia and from students working in Agar, mm -hmm. so that's, that's my okay. area of concern. Good, thanks. Sure. So, so um, Mo, you, you have a clear developing world strategy, I mean, that, that, and, and that makes uh, great sense. For, for uh, Darren, for, uh, you know, the, the uh, high-end medical devices, is there a developing world strategy? Or is that even on your radar screen? It's, to be honest, it's, it really isn't as much on our radar screen. Um, well, I, I guess I should ask which geographies you're, you're thinking just, about. Just riff on it, whatever, just, whatever you want to say. So, uh, you know, in develop... <laughs> Uh, it's hard to even think about, you know, whether Brazil and China and India are developing or whether they're way ahead of the United States at this point. <laughs> so, <laughs> depending how you how you look right. at it, but uh, advanced developing, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, I mean, I was just talking to uh, some surgeons in Brazil this uh, this past weekend at a, at a large medical conference, and you know, I, I look at the infrastructure they have down there. It's it's really exciting. Like our technology would dovetail beautifully into that, uh, because at the heart of it, even what we're doing is we're taking a very invasive technology and making it, you know, basically a conscious sedation outpatient procedure. It's moving from an expensive OR to a very uh, a much less expensive endoscopy suite, and that's a model that could work very well in in regions where. You know, capital costs could be a huge barrier uh, to offer procedures for patients. So, you know, we, we definitely see there's there's plenty of um, opportunity there, and uh, a lot of you know the it's incredible actually how much the procedure volumes were were growing in Brazil. Mm -hmm. So that's that's a market we're going to be monitoring very closely. So so we're we're going to get in just a minute to kind of asking you guys to look around the corner. And again, I'd welcome any questions about that from the audience. But but uh, sort of to prime the pump for that one thing that that I'm hearing a lot anyway from from young innovators, young companies is that really the name of the game now is to figure out what the strategics uh, want to do uh, right away, if, if possible, have that discussion uh, and, and, and get funding you know, at a seed stage or, or a series A. What, what, are, what are you seeing and, and what do you think about that? Maybe I'll start with Darren Hyde again on, on that. On um, what strategic? So, so, what, uh, so, so the idea being that you need to know, because uh, it's so tough now to go, go through a series, you know, A, B, C, D, that, that you really need a partnership uh, worked out with a strategic early on. And the best thing to do is, is to really start uh, right away with that, that kind of partnership discussion. Yeah, I don't know if it, that's the best thing to do to start that way, actually. Um, I think the, thing, the, the places where we've succeeded in dealing with bigger companies is usually to have a technology that scares them a little bit, that <laughs> takes their mind share of their key physicians, or you know, you can go to uh, Europe, let's say, and uh, have their highest uh, using physician start to use your product and then tell his friends mm -hmm. that, and get them to start using the product, and then all of a sudden they really want to be your partner. Um, before then, I, I, it hasn't really happened as much for us. Mo, in your, in your world? So I, I don't think I'm doing anything that the, the big med techs would be interested in, again, because our model is so different. I'm actually getting more interest from the strategics like Intel, Cisco, um, Qualcomm. Sure. How about you, Darren? I, I mean, this has been our model. We were, we were in a garage uh, when Johnson & Johnson invested in us. I don't know if they knew we were in a garage at the time. But uh, yeah, it, you know, looking at the capital requirements for a, a class three device and, you know, I wanted to make sure that there would be a tremendous amount of alignment. And what, and I know that there was a tremendous amount of controversy when I talked to advisors and mentors about do you bring a strategic in early and what are the pros and cons there and do, do they put handcuffs on you? And, and you know, it's all how you structure a deal. Uh, you can make it so that it works great for the company. And Johnson Johnson has been a tr tremendous partner and has been extremely helpful. So uh, if you know, I were to do it all over again, I would certainly uh, jump into bed early with a, a strategic. Uh, I think they provide profound insights on you know, what the market's doing right now. And well, the what does that look like? What, what's your actual interface with, with the company? I mean, what kinds of people are helping you? And So um, 
we also have a strategic relationship with, obviously, Johnson Johnson's a very large company. Uh, Ethicon Endosurgery is the segment that um, focuses on bariatric uh, surgery as well as all, you know, surgical type devices. And, you know, we, it, it gives us the ability to interface with experts uh, from reimbur reimbursement, clinical, regulatory, marketing. Uh, you know, it really brings a tremendous amount of resources to bear that, frankly, we could never afford uh, as a startup company. Mm -hmm. Uday, you have a relationship with St. Jude? Yeah, so St. Jude invested in us at our B round after we had F uh, clearance and we're really starting to market our, our product. Um, and, and I think that's more typical. They want to see a little bit later stage where there's going to perhaps be an impact that some of the regulatory or other risks have been taken off the table. While I think all of the big companies and strategics are all thinking they'd like to invest earlier, I think the reality is that, you know, you might be exception, that it doesn't really happen because it's still di too different from their DNA at the moment. So I don't know how much, how often that's happening. The other thing I would say is when you do make a deal with a strategic, if you have multiple potential strategic exit partners, there's a downside, there's a plus and minus of having one of those as your partner. So our deal leaves the back end open. You know, there's no, it's just a, it's an investor, they're an investor, and we have a co-marketing relationship. So they help market our products, but that's where it ends. Um, so I do think it's very important to leave, to make sure that when you structure those deals, if possible, you think about the pros and cons of what that means downstream. Because if they're getting everything they want from you and you're locked into them, that could be a tough situation for you. Uh, whereas if you're not, that could be actually to your advantage. Yeah, so we have seen some deals with people trying to lock up our companies. You know, we'll invest early, but if you're ever anything, we own you. Yeah. And that's a bad position to be in, uh -huh. for sure. Uh -huh. Anybody with uh, experience in the audience with, uh, are, are you in companies that have a close uh, strategic partner? Anybody here? A few of the venture people are seeing these, I'm, I'm sure, at this point. But, but Menno, any, any comment about this from your standpoint? So, so uh, if you don't know Menno, Menno is one of the very experienced uh, serial CEOs in MedTech in the Valley. Thanks, Paul. I, I think that uh, everything, there is no general rules, and as we can see in the panel here, uh, the gentleman has a terrific relationship with J&J. &J. I'm sure he put together a deal that he can get out of it, and actually it would be more attractive to a potential other buyer, knowing that J&J &J has interest in his deal. So That's there are no <laughs> rules, <laughs> and uh, I think that uh, we need to be very open to learn and find out where the opportunities are. Whether we're doing a global deal, well, maybe the best opportunity is in the US. What are you trying to accomplish? You are trying to prove the product works? Where can you prove it? Maybe you don't have to go through FDA approval. Maybe you can do basically an FEM, FIM in the US, and that will trigger a nice deal for you. So I would recommend that basically the, the market and the needs are continuously changing. It's like a pendulum. We're talking about healthcare reform, where my, my big success was in 1995, when Hillary Clinton tried to introduce healthcare reform. And cost was everything that everybody talked about. And I had a product that basically I didn't even know what it was good for. <laughs> <laughs> but, and then I did a clinical study to prove it's value, it's clinical value. And I found out that it can cut significantly the number of angioplasties in the US. And happened to be that at that time, healthcare reform, cost savings, capitation, was the big buzz. The cardiologist obviously didn't like it. Those are my customers. But the financial community loved it. And I was able to take the company public. But then after a year and a half or two, healthcare reform didn't work. Then I rushed to sell it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's, uh, let's bring this around. Yeah, Guido, please. Can, do you mind using the mic? Thanks. I can speak loud, but uh, I'll use the mic. My name is Guido Nails. I have a long history with Guidant and, many, and a few other companies. I'm now a venture capitalist. Um, and I'm learning a lot. I'm really happy to hear that uh, people are thinking now about countries like um, Germany and um, 
Holland, which is the Netherlands, by the way. And so, um, <laughs> I, you know, I have a couple of things that I really want to point out. It's uh, nothing, there's a lot of advice that you should get. We should you make up your own minds about things. First, about, uh, uh, about dealing with large companies. I think it's in your best interest to, as a CEO, to start early uh, having conversations with um, uh, strategics, and there are only about 10. And so, um, because you're going to learn a lot, you're going to learn how they think, and when the moment is right, then you can, you can kind of step in. You're right, you should really, uh, um, there are lots of ways of structuring this, and so I don't think it hurts to, to speak with them and even uh, to get an investment, because um, a lot of the large companies have now stepped in where VCs have stepped out. And so they are actually very attractive, um, uh, very attractive potential investors because they are taking more risks because in the balance sheet it doesn't, or in the profit, uh, in the P&L, it doesn't mean a hell of a lot. Uh, and particularly where they are talking about the, uh, the wide spaces, I think it can be really interesting. But also they, uh, large companies are doing two things. They want to feed their distribution system or they want to fill the white spaces. And I, so you got to kind of understand where, where you're going to fit. Um, and while I have the microphone, Paul, um, please, um, I, um, you know, um, Europe doesn't exist in healthcare. You should really understand that very well. Um, every country, um, you can only get a CE mark, and that's just about it. And um, mm. the problem is your boards don't understand, most of your boards don't understand that either. And there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of talk about this. But um, every country, once you have a CE mark, every country will want more clinical data, will particularly want what is called now health technology assessments. So they will want to establish in their particular country um, um, if this is of value. In Europe, we have, um, uh, the, the, the system has thought about value and cost of the system. You know, doctors get educated in thinking about the cost uh, when, they, when, they prescribe, uh, when they prescribe a therapy. So uh, every, country is diff every country is different on how they reimburse the system. Some countries don't really have a reimbursement system, but they have hospital uh, budgets. So um, my point is you want to really focus on, um, on uh, one or two countries and go deep in a few centers because you're going to waste a tremendous amount of money. And you have to understand why you're going outside of, those, uh, out, outside of those countries. There's two reasons basically why you want to do it. Is if you have a PMA, you want to understand better how your, how your th therapy works and adjust it as you go. So you want to, once you file for an IND, then you know you have a very high probability that you're actually going to be successful and you're going to get PMA approval. And I think that's what Arian did. You know, they established very well the therapy. Now we really understand this therapy actually works. And before the company has actually an IND, just like Core Valve, um, <coughs> they now they they monetized their investment. Uh, Core Valve existed for almost uh, for more than 10 years, and well, Ardian was only four years. Back to your point: if it's a big therapy, you know it doesn't have to be IT Paul. So. Um, the second thing why, uh, why you would want to go there is basically to prove to, particularly to the large investors, or I'm sorry, to the large companies, is that you actually have adoption. That people will, you know, pe uh, people meaning doctors, will prescribe you therapy and hospitals will actually pay for it. And so because then they think, all right, this is something very worthwhile. I have a much bigger, uh, I, have a, I can integrate this in my, in my distribution system, sorry. Well, thank you. It's great to have experts like this. And speaking of that, Anne, uh, th this, we'll have to keep this short because we need to wrap, but, but please. Yeah, I, I, from an angel perspective, first I have to agree with Guido and as a good Belgium, you know, Europe is a whole bunch of different countries that happen to be on yeah. the same continent. But um, from an angel point of view, anything we see that's a PMA and all of that, we punt. Uh, except we've made exceptions, and the one we invested in is company that we can, with a small amount of capital, 
the risk to product and the market adoption. And we usually do that by going to Europe. When we talk to the big corporation, what they're telling us to say, we want to redo the PMA and the IDE our way anyway uh, because we don't think you know how to do quality control. So don't spend a lot of money there. Just show me this market adoption with a few key centers and that will buy you out. And these are the deals that are being funded. The other comment I wanted to make is earlier on the global, we have in our portfolio company, companies that are in India and they have great traction and they got the government to pass a law to say you have to do it. The problem is getting them funded for the series B and C because the venture capital is in the US and they're still not comfortable even investing in an American corporation where the market is overseas. So that we have a problem in scaling these models. Yeah, good points, thanks. Uh, and this does uh, bring us to uh, final thoughts and, and we have less than a minute each, but, but let me ask you to think about uh, either, you know, if, 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 so, so suppose that uh, you all got bought out tomorrow, uh, tremendous success. What, what, what's your next thing and what, what direction, what piece of advice uh, do you have? And we'll just go down the line. A succinct piece of advice. Uday. Uh, well, <laughs> that would be, I think I take a vacation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I think uh, what I would do would, uh, you know, I think, you know, the only thing that's valuable in life is time. <laughs> Money can only buy time. I have two little kids. I spend a lot of time with them. I spend more time with them. Okay. <laughs> Darren. Well, well my, my first little one's on the way, so I'm sure I'll learn that lesson very quickly. Uh, consume, like what's, uh, what I, has been really exciting about Hourglass, and I want to continue, is uh, the focus on consumers, patients as consumers. Uh, and I, I think I may uh, shift more towards you know devices that patients can actually just actually buy and pay for themselves. Uh, and that when they really see the value, then I think it's a great medical device. Uh, so and I'm looking for more consumer-centric technology. Great. Um, but I'm a big believer when there's deep regulatory change, there's deep opportunities at the tail end of that. So I would keep a, a, a close eye on health reform. And just think of, the, again, the fundamental statistics. Healthcare costs are going up. We're getting more elderly people in the population. They have more chronic disease, which drives more costs, and we now have less physicians because all the Stanford kids are retiring and going to business school. So, so technology and solutions can help solve or mitigate some of those problems. So it's a good place to think through. Yeah, I would, I would just start by saying I think it's a really exciting time to be doing what we're doing. I think that there's a lot of change happening, and I think a lot of good will come out of it, and a lot of opportunity will come out of it. Um, I like the fact that this, the convergence of other industries outside of healthcare are finally getting into healthcare. It's happened in, the, in finance and, and not so much in education, but it's on its way there too. So I would focus on how uh, mobile devices, the internet, IT, um, cloud computing can actually get into healthcare and make uh, meaningful change to healthcare. So I'm optimistic. Well, I'm sure the panelists will stick around for a little bit after we wind up. This really brings us to the end of the summit. I see some of the organizers uh, in the office, in the audience. Congratulations on a, on a terrific uh, day. Uh, thank you and thank you, panelists.